So we asked Rami what was his, what we could add. What we could add. <laughs> and he said he wishes that he was the person his dog thinks he is. And that's my dog. I just want to thank everybody for coming to the webinar this afternoon, or maybe this evening, depending on where you are. And I wish you all a, a blessed Easter and a happy Passover, and a joyous spring, and just a good, what's today? Sunday, or for some of you, maybe Monday. I want to talk a little bit about what a holy rascal is, and some of the, the insight I've learned from other holy rascals. And we're going to start with Sister Jose Hobde, because she's the one who gave me the term. She labeled me a holy rascal, and I'd never thought of it, never heard of it before she did it. She's a Catholic nun and a Native American medicine woman. And I was teaching with her at the Aspen Chapel, and I'm in Aspen Chapel right at the moment. And she was sitting in the very back of the room, and as soon as I had finished speaking, and I don't know what I was talking about, well, actually, I never know what I'm talking about. But anyway, I was giving some talk, and when I finished, she jumps up in the back of the room, and she goes, he's a holy rascal! And the label stuck, but I didn't know what it meant. So I finally you know, talked to her a little bit about it and got some sense, but it was really only after her, um, when she passed away, that I really started to wonder what she had in mind. And She died in 2009. So I can't quote her exactly, but this is the gist of what she said. She said, holy refers to a passion. She's talking about my passion, but holy refers to our passion for spiritual truth and awakening. And rascal refers to our use of humor to shatter the systems that claim to give these to us. So what's true of, of me, if, I was a holy, if I'm a holy rascal, is true of all holy rascals. We're passionate seekers of truth who just can't resist telling the truth about religion. So let's just take a, a look at, at a short clip uh, of, of Sister Jose. You know, there's so many things in life that you don't understand, that they are mysteries. But you put your ra arms around mystery. And when you put your arms around mystery, sometimes what looks like death will turn out to be life. And sometimes what looks like life will turn out to be death. But if you can walk with mystery, it will come to you what the meanings are. But if you can't walk with mystery, if you have to know why and understand every bit now, then you never will be satisfied and you never will be happy. You know, what she says about mystery is so important. I've seen that little clip dozens of times and every time I watch it, I'm reminded how important her message really is. Put holy rascals aside for a second. Just the notion of walking with mystery. For Easter, sometimes something that looks like, you know, like death is really life. I mean, it's a great Easter message. But the idea of mystery even more so. Mystery means that you never really know. Nobody really knows what the ultimate reality is. And we'll talk about that more later when we reference uh, Hinduism and, and Taoism and the fact that you really cannot know. You can't put it into words. So it is a mystery, at least a mystery to the egoic self. But we try so desperately, and then we come, come up with these ideas that this is the answer, and we have to either accept them or reject them, but the holy rascal shatters them. And we do it through humor primarily. I, I hope most of us who are doing this kind of thing are doing it through humor, but not, not abrasive humor, not humor that that uh, just humor that tears down walls without tearing down people. And I got, I mean, I think that's true. And somebody sent me an email and it said that, that holy rascals are stand-up theologians who use humor as much as sacred text and teachings to plow through the BS of religion to arrive at the universal truths each religion seeks to monopolize. Right? Each religion says it has the truth. Holy rascals use humor as well as text to shatter that illusion. So the best stand-up comedians, meaning, of course, those I like the most, are those who hold up a mirror to humanity's foibles and allow us to see ourselves as we really are and do so in a way that evokes laughter. We laugh at ourselves, and we're free from the insanity about which we're laughing. <laughs> so the, the clip on George Carlin is his classic clip about religion. Now, George Carlin 
I say he's a holy rascal, but his humor here is devastating. But it's so funny, and I think so right on, that we'll, we'll allow the grittiness of it to, to we'll welcome that with, with an open heart and, and see what he's really trying to do behind it. So let's watch this. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day and the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do what he said i think whether you like the way he said it or not what i think he said is 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 true and it, it definitely deserves looking into but it's the laughter part that i want to really talk about so when i was a kid growing up in my parents house we subscribed to reader's digest and each issue of Reader's Digest had a little section called Laughter is the Best Medicine. Uh, so today, given the cost of medical care in the United States, laughter may be the only medicine you can afford, but that's not what they were, uh, you know, they were talking about in the magazine. The idea in the magazine was is that when you laugh, laughter itself is healing. And it's healing because it alters our consciousness. Now, you can check this out for yourself. What happens when you laugh? When, you know, physiologically, your immune system gets a boost of antiviral and anti-infection cells. And your brain and body release hormones and peptides that reduce stress and endorphins that give rise to feelings of connection and affection. This is all from the act of laughing. As your breath comes in the form of short gasps, you're practicing a kind of pranayama, the Hindu breath meditation. Pran is the Sanskrit word for breath or life force, and ayam means to extend. So when you laugh, you're extending your life force. You're embracing the world and feeling held by it as well. So when you connect to that greater reality, that awakens you to your larger self, the, the soul or the Atman. And when you're laughing, it's impossible to cling to thoughts. It's impossible to cling to theologies. It's impossible to cling to the boxes that religion tries to put us in. So when our smaller self, the egoic self, is caught up in laughter, it's freed to be that larger self, or the soul. My Zen master, Joshu Suzaki Roshi, back in the 1970s, and he's still alive, he's 106. In the 1970s, I was studying with him, and during one of the retreats, he said that Zazen, Zen meditation, is good. But he said, get up every morning, sit on the edge of your bed, and just laugh. Now, at first, it's going to be forced laughter. But just stay with it. And eventually, you actually start to genuinely laugh. And then he said, just keep laughing until you're just drained. And then he said, go about your day. Zazen is extra. Meditation is extra. If you just could laugh to that moment of exhaustion each morning, your day would be a day of liberate uh, of, of freedom. <laughs> I love the Wizard of Oz. And in the Wizard of Oz, my favorite character is Toto. I mean, when I ask people who, what's their favorite character in the Wizard of Oz, they talk about uh, Dorothy and they talk about uh, the Tin Man and the Coward, you know, all the main characters. I like Toto best. If Holy Rascals had a mascot, the mascot would be Toto. And it's because what Toto does in the movie. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh, the great Oz has spoken. Oh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I yes. don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. You humbug! Yeah. Uh, yes, it's exactly so. I'm a humbug. Oh. I think what you see there is so important. 
I don't want to come across as being anti-religion. I mean, I'm a rabbi, so I, I work in that, in that world. I'm not anti-religion. I'm anti what religion often does. I'm, I'm, I'm pro-religion at its best. You know, the word religion means to unite, to yoke. It has the same meaning, though they're not, not the same etymological origin, as the word yoga, to, to unite. And what religion is supposed to do is to unite our small self with our larger self. And the larger self is the self that we all share, the, the, the divine mind, if you like. And that's what I think humor helps us do, but that's what religion at its best ought to do. But it's rarely at its best. It, instead of, of uniting us to this transcendent and, and all-encompassing reality of which we are all a part, it creates these boxes of competing brands and then sets us one against the other. And each one of them needs a toto. Each one of them needs a dog. And notice, you know, Dorothy and the others are cowed. I don't know how many animals I'm going to throw in here. They're cowed, but the dog is not cowed. And Toto is just goes right in and pulls the curtain back and just lets us see the truth. And the truth is that so much of what passes for organized religion is simply a small man and now a small woman with a large megaphone. And even though I think it's very important that religions are opening up to women in equal status to men, especially in the clergy, the role they play, whether it's a man or a woman, is the same role. It's just a small person with a large megaphone who's trying to scare the crap out of us so that we'll join their club and, like George Carlin said, give them money. That's not what religion is about. By the way, we also want you to give us money, but that's another story. Uh, so, so we have to be able to see beyond that. That's the job of the holy rascal. And to do it with humor, and to do it with, with a sense of grace, and to do it with a sense of humility, and to realize that as often as we see the person behind the curtain, we also have our own curtains and, and our, own, our own megaphones that we're playing with. So regardless of claims to the contrary, I would argue, the work of rabbis and pastors and priests and imams and shamans and gurus and all the rest is to maintain their status as spiritual insiders, People who know something that we don't know, and I don't mean know just in, in the sense of knowledge. There's, I always go to teachers, I always go to specialists to learn something in, in the realm of, of the intellect. But when, it, when they're talking about theological knowing, that's not the same thing. When they're talking about uh, ideas that, uh, when, when they're talking about realities that we cannot put into words, but that they do put into words, and then say these are the absolute words and you must believe this way, they lose me. And that's when you need Toto to pull them back. And I think that's what the holy rascal is going to do. The theologians within each religion themselves cannot free themselves from their box. I've never heard, in the decades of, of working in this field, I have never heard, with the exception of maybe, maybe Brother Wayne Teasdale, but if you go to a, a, a priest in the Catholic Church, Rarely, and if you ask that priest about God, rarely do they, they come up with anything other than Christ. Not because there's nothing outside the Christ paradigm, but because that's their box. A Catholic theologian is never going to discover that Krishna is God. It's just not in their script. The Hindu who believes in Krishna, they're not going to discover Christ is God. The Jew who, who believes that God says that the Jews are the chosen people, very few are willing to say, oh, you know what, we made that up. I mean, calling the Jews the chosen people is no different, and, and if this is offensive, I know. But when the Jews call ourselves the, the chosen people, it's just like Coca-Cola calling itself the real thing. But they're selling Coke, right? They're selling brown sugar water. We're selling another story, the Jewish story that has all kinds of stuff attached to it. God's into real estate, this, certain, this slip of land is, is ours from, you know, uh, from millennia ago. I mean, all this stuff, it's our story. It's our brand and our branding efforts. But it's not true in any kind of existential sense. It's only true within the story. And what I want from the holy rascals of the world is to pull back that curtain and have us realize that it's just a person expressing a brand opinion in a very large, with a very large microphone, and a very large megaphone, and it scares us. So 
we should be holy rascals, but we should also be totos, which is why probably the word God is dog spelled backwards. So let's take a look at this text from the Rig Veda. The Rig Veda is the oldest religious book. Truth is one. Different people call it by different names. That is absolutely true. Truth is one. Different people call it by different names. But it's not the full truth because no name gets to the truth. You can't reduce ultimate reality to a noun, a name, a concept. And so in addition to the Rig Veda, I like what Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching, the classic of Chinese Taoism. And in the Tao Te Ching, he says, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. The word Tao here, now we can use as a stand-in for any absolute theological concept. So the God that can be named is not the, the eternal God. The theology that you can articulate is not the ultimate, absolute, true eternal theology. Because, con because language is so limited. Language is, reflects our own limited mindsets. And you cannot take the divine, which for me is the universe and beyond, you can't take that and reduce it to an idea and then say, okay, this is it, follow this idea, or chant this name, and it's, it becomes magic. And while I have a deep respect for magic, but that's another, another issue, we're talking about bad magic. We're talking about tricking people into saying X and, and thinking that just X is going to get it, going to get you saved. So where I live in Middle Tennessee, a lot of the people that I know believe that God only hears your prayer if you pray in Jesus' name. In the Bhagavad Gita, there is a line where Krishna says that he doesn't care what name you use because regardless of the name you use, Krishna always responds. That's because Krishna is the only God there is. And his name is irrelevant. So you can call him anything you want. Jesus or Adonai or Allah or you know, Brahman or you know, the, the Holy Spirit or the Great Spirit. Whatever you call him, Krishna responds. Because Krishna is all there is. I want to get beyond the name Krishna as well. But I want to make it clear that when a religion says you have to use this name, it's devolving into a, a, a basic kind of, of distorted magic that isn't really true. And we have to cut through that. So yes, we have this finger, the Buddhists would call it, a Zen Buddhist call it, the finger pointing to the moon. But the moon itself we cannot name. So the, 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 what it's pointing toward, we have all kinds of concepts that get maybe close, I don't know. But we have to go, we, we, all of them are pointing toward the same thing. But the thing itself, as Lao Tzu says, is beyond naming. Because there's not one name, there's not one way. There's just your way. And that's really what we're getting at. And yet, let me, so let me, having said that, let me also say that within every religious tradition, there is a thread of teaching that they all share. It's not in their official theologies. It's in their mystical speculations. And when you, when you investigate the mysticisms of the world's great religions, and, and, and other areas of spirituality as well. But when you investigate those uh, mystical teachings, over and over again, you will discover what's called the perennial wisdom or the perennial philosophy. Aldous Huxley in the 1940s, in uh, his introduction to a translation of the Bhagavad Gita, articulated the perennial philosophy in four points. So here, here they are. I'm, I'm, in his thing, it's long, but I'm making them very one-liners. The first thing is, everything is God. So the analogy that the Hindus use is that of the ocean and the wave. So think of, of an infinite ocean with infinite waves, and you and I and everything else that exists is a wave on that ocean. The second point is, that means you. Right? You're also part of this divine reality. There is no separation between you and God. The third thing is that the extent to which you don't know that is the extent to which you suffer unnecessarily. There's necessary suffering in the world, 
but unnecessary suffering, the suffering that's caused by you feeling alienated from, separated from, apart from rather than a part of the divine. That suffering is alleviated when you know who you are. And the third one is it's possible to wake up to who you actually are. So, so in four quick statements, that's what the, the perennial wisdom is about. Let me be very clear that I'm not saying that all religions are teaching the same thing. They don't. The perennial wisdom that runs through all religions are teaching the same thing. But each religion has its own theology. You may agree with one and disagree with the others. That's fine. But the perennial wisdom can be found in all of them. And that's where I'm coming from. And that's where I think most holy rascals are coming from. The Vedanta analogy of the ocean and the wave serves us well here. Just as each wave is nothing but the ocean, manifest in that wave's unique place and time, so too each wave is a unique and never-to-be-repeated manifestation of that ocean, worthy of our utmost respect and dignity. The perennial wisdom doesn't demean the lesser self, the wave, or seek to eradicate it. On the contrary, it celebrates that self, as a part of the whole. Who is that guy? I like what he says. Because a lot, of, a lot of religions will say you have to kill yourself. I don't mean suicide, I mean kill the ego. First of all, how would you ever do that? Because the person who has to kill the ego is actually the ego. So it doesn't, it doesn't really work. But the holy rascal realizes and the perennial wisdom realizes that the ego has a place. It's just not at the center of things. The difference is when we're separate from the divine, the ego plays at being God, which makes us miserable ultimately. But when we realize the true nature of reality, we know that it's God who's playing at being us. You know, God is Kathying, and God is Wendying, and God is Ramying, and God is Alicing, and Adaming, and I could go through the whole list, but there's too many of you on there, so I won't. But you get the idea. God is doing uh, your existence at the moment. And when we know that, the unnecessary suffering of life just falls away. Because it's a suffering that we create from a sense of alienation. And when you understand the true relationship between yourself and God, meaning it's one, you know, Jesus puts it, I and the Father are one. Christianity says only Jesus and the Father are one. The perennial wisdom says what Jesus is saying about himself, each of us must come to realize for ourselves. In Judaism, when he said that, it was shocking. Like when Al-Hajj in uh, Islam said something very similar, I am the truth with a capital T, it was shocking. He was killed, Jesus was killed. If these people were only smart enough to say it in India, they would have been applauded. But that's because you know, different religions have different sensitivities. But once you know who you really are, the madness that we create for ourselves is no longer created. And the suffering that's associated with it just goes away. And we shift from what's called a non-zero worldview. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we shift from what's called a zero-sum worldview to what's called a non-zero-sum worldview. A zero-sum worldview is a worldview of winners and losers. A non-zero-sum worldview is a worldview of winners and winners. In the, in the zero-sum world, if I'm going to win, you have to lose because there's just not enough of the pie to go along. If I want more pie, you get less pie. 
But in the non-zero worldview, the pi is infinite. So I love, there's a, there's a parable that Jesus tells about uh, the, the uh, landowner, the, the, the vineyard owner, who needs workers to do the harvest. And he hires people in the beginning of the day, and then he needs more, so he gets more late morning, and then he still needs more, he gets more in the early afternoon, and he keeps hiring people throughout the day till the very end of the day, he gets another, you know, I was going to say busload, but they don't have buses, so another cartload of people uh, come, and they help him, and they finish the harvest, and he pays them all the same wage, the wage that he promised the people he hired in the very beginning. And those people complain. And their argument is, we worked all day for this, this, this amount of money, and someone else worked an hour, and he gave them the same amount of money. Then Jesus reveals to them what's what. And what's what is, th- the money is just infinite. Everyone gets the same. It's not that you can get more or less when we're talking about the divine. When you realize that you are part of God, you are part of the entirety of God. It would be like going to the ocean to go swimming, and someone dives in at dawn, and someone dives in at noon, and someone dives in at six in the afternoon and stays in for only 15 minutes. It's not that the person who went in at dawn got more ocean than the person who went in at six in the evening. They got the entire ocean. The time they spent was different, but the ocean itself was theirs. The infinite is part of who we are. And we shift, when we know that, the shift goes from uh, protecting what we have to sharing what we have from the the zero-sum winner-take-all to the non-zero-sum where everyone wins in order for everyone to win. I can only win in a non-zero-sum world if you're also a winner. And that's core to the ethics of of what uh, the perennial wisdom teaches, to to manifest that non-zero world. So Jesus ends that parable by saying, this is his capstone phrase, and he says, if you would... You know, in a zero-sum world, you want to be first, but in the non-zero kingdom of the divine, of the awakened heart, the awakened mind that Jesus teaches, that Buddha teaches, that Krishna teaches, that the great mystics of all the world's religions teach, when you, when you get to that awareness, you realize, as he says, the first will be last, and the last will be first. So normally when I teach this at the university where I teach Bible, and we're studying the New Testament, in fact, we're starting that, that section right now, when I get to this, this parable and I ask my students what they think it means, and they say, well, because you were so egotistical and you wanted to be first in, in the kingdom, you'll just be last. That's just another version of zero-sum thinking. There's still a first, there's still a last. It's just who's on top and who's on the bottom, it changes. Jesus is not saying that. He says, if you would be first, you will be last. If you're last, you will be first. Now go to the little slide. So if you're first, suddenly you're made last. If you're last, suddenly you're made first. Wait, now if you're first again, now you're going to be last again. No, I'm last. I'll be made first. Oh, first. No, ma'am. I'm now I'm back, back and being last. It just goes round and round and round until you finally say, enough with first and last. And I think that's what, that's what he's trying to get us to, to realize. So the fourth point of the perennial wisdom that's at the heart of being a holy rascal is that you're here on this planet to wake up to point one and then to have point two and three follow. So the the four points of the wisdom itself are circular. The reason you're here is to realize your true nature. And your true nature is the divine. The, the, The truth is that you are a wave on this infinite divine ocean. And our purpose is to realize that. And when we realize that, we become, I don't know if the word is servants or, or stewards or midwives to the, the, the love and the compassion that the world, that the world contains. So you can, you can read in uh, the book of Genesis in the Bible, chapter 12, verse 3, where God is talking to Abraham and Sarah, but I believe when, when Bible characters are involved, they're really all about us. So it's God is talking to you through Abraham and Sarah, and God says, you know, God is telling them to leave their, their conditioned world, get away from your family, get away from your culture, your ethnicity, all of that, to free yourself from all of that, and then go to a place that I'll show you, and the purpose of going there is not, as Judaism would have it, to set up this ideal kingdom on this slip of land in the Middle East. Your purpose, Genesis says, is to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. 
That's the mission of, the huma of humanity, but that's your personal mission statement. You know, there's all these books on, on uh, incorporating yourself and, and branding yourself, and you need a mission statement. Well, the Bible gives you a mission statement that is universal, and it says that you're here to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. All the families. So thousands of years ago when they came up with that, that idea, I'm sure they weren't thinking the way I'm thinking. But when I hear in the 21st century, all the families, I'm thinking not just all the human families, but all the families of all living things in the universe. I am to live in such a way that my being in the world, my living in the world, is a blessing to them. It helps them thrive. It helps them survive. It helps them reach their own divine potential, whether it's human or, or, or otherwise. That's why we're here. We're not here to become famous or to get rich or to wield power. We're here to know that all beings and us ourselves are God and to know them as God, to experience them as divine beings. The diverse wavings of the cosmic ocean, that's, that's God. So these four points of perennial wisdom come up over and over and over again in every religious tradition. You can find them in your own root tradition. You don't have to shift to someplace else. If you're a Hindu, you can find them in Advaita Vedanta or in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. And if you're Buddhist, you can find them in that tradition. If you're Christian, you can find them in that tradition. No tradition is empty of these four points. That's why they're called perennial. They keep coming back as the mystics rediscover them in each of the traditions. The mystics themselves oftentimes fare poorly because people don't like to hear the message. So they're exiled or murdered or silenced in some other way. It's because they're a threat to the powers that be. Not because they want to replace the powers, but because they dare to reveal them for what they are, little humans with big megaphones. And that's our job as holy rascals, to reveal the truth about, about these powers, about the theologies that, that divide us rather than unite us. Let's talk about these, these, the, you know, what it is to do. What, what does a holy rascal do? So I think that you can get the message, the, the, the marching orders, if you like, from the prophet Micah. Now, again, you can get them from everywhere. But in the, the, the book about, uh, that the prophet Micah wrote or his school wrote, he has this long thing where he says, what do you think God wants? And he lists all the things that people are used to, sacrificing animals and all kinds of other things. And then he says, God doesn't want any of that. He says, you know humanity. He's not talking to Jews. He says, you know humanity, what God requires. And it's three things. Do justly, act kindly, and walk humbly with your God. So doing justly means moving out of that zero-sum world. Acting kindly is probably best understood as the golden rule. Not doing to other people what you wouldn't want them to do to you. And then walking humbly. It's not simply cultivating humility in yourself. It's because the way Micah puts it is walk humbly with your God. And the rabbis then say, why does it say your God? Why doesn't it just say, walk humbly with God? And their answer is brilliant. And their answer is because everyone has his or her own imagined God. That's got to go. That's the, the, the name that cannot be named. We're worshiping our names. And Micah is saying, hold those names lightly. Doesn't say throw them away. Just know that when you're saying Jesus or Krishna or Adonai or Allah or whatever it is, Brahman, you're, you're really referring to something that transcends the name, and the name is not the thing. So that's it, really. I mean, that's, that's, that's a summary of what it is to be a holy rascal. So we're going to take some questions in a second, but let me just be very clear for a moment. Now, now you know what it is that a holy rascal is and does, and how a holy rascal thinks and acts a little bit. The question is, do you want to be one? Because we need holy rascals, not just Wendy and, and Kathy and I. <laughs> Right, you know, we need that too. But the world needs holy rascals. So, you know, but we live in a world where certificates matter, and, and I am happy to certify you. How do I get my finger in the picture there? It's you as a holy rascal. I will do that for you. You have to prove that you're a holy rascal in good standing. And the way to do that, send us a check for $10,000. You send me a check for $10,000, and I will send you a certificate suitable for framing as soon as the check clears. 
Of course, anyone with a Holy Rascal certificate is admitting that he or she isn't an authentic Holy Rascal, but I don't care, I've got your $10,000. Rami, you're missing the last point on uh, what uh, Micah should have said. Okay. Have had there something about doing it with a humorous grin on your face in order to be a holy rascal. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know what the Lord requires. Be funny. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so Jay from Madison. <laughs> Jay from Madison writes, the perennial wisdom list said suffering is necessary, unnecessary. What suffering is necessary? Ah, Great question. So th- there's a suffering that's natural to life. When someone you love dies, everyone's going to die. That's a natural thing. When someone you love is murdered, that's not, you know, that's something else. When uh, a, a storm comes and, and people are uprooted or, or killed, that's natural suffering. Illness, I mean, the Buddha, the Buddha said it's, it's um, you know, illness, old age, death, accident. I mean, those are the things that I have in mind that are necessary suffering. They're, they're not caused by people, they're not, uh, well, well, it's not 100% true, but, but um, well, no, it's, it, it is true. Unnecessary suffering is just part of nature, and it's not aimed at us, we're just caught up in it. It's not a reward, it's not punishment in any way, it just happens to us. So, so that, that's what I had in mind by un, uh, unnecessary suffering, uh, by necessary suffering, and unnecessary suffering is what we do to ourselves. In, in 1992, I lived through Hurricane Andrew, that was necessary suffering. Nature needed a hurricane, and so we had one. My house was damaged. Other homes were totally destroyed. That's necessary suffering, and and we all help each other out. A couple of days after, when the roads were clear enough that people could get through, people were coming into our neighborhood, which was totally devastated, with ice, because we had no no electricity for weeks and no air conditioning. People brought us ice, but a 99-cent bag of ice before the storm was selling for $20 after the storm. That's unnecessary suffering. That's people taking advantage. And then Elizabeth from Guatemala. Thank you for for checking in for so far uh, away from us. How did the current members of the Holy Rascals come together, and how often do you spend time together? Oh, no, we don't don't actually meet uh, in in some kind. It's not a club. You know, that's, I, I wish it were. It would be fun to have holy rascal conventions. I don't know what hotel would house us. <laughs> but uh, we'd have to do it in, you know, during Mardi Gras or something in New Orleans. But, uh, so, yeah, we don't actually get together. When you do it. Sorry, say that again? Do it down south when you do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, we have a question yeah, from... I've been a holy rascal most of my life. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, um... Ian, I think, uh, maybe. Question, yeah, it looks like Ian from Philadelphia. I'm not, I'm not reading the text too clearly. Is there a Holy Rascal training program in the works? Not exactly. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to turn... I, I don't, so there's the webinars, right? But, but um, the, yes, I'd ch- I would cash your $10,000 check. And yes, Wendy and Kathy need... <laughs> Money to keep the web, to keep the website going. To we have so many hours of video to, to edit and, and make available to you with with people like um, you know John Borisenko and uh, Father Thomas Keating and all all these wonderful teachers that we've interviewed. So we do need money for that, but we really don't intend to make this another thing. You know, with, oh now I really am. I, I I took my holy rascal badge and I've got that and. You know, we're really not, not saying that. We're just saying that a holy rascal is someone who's willing to play Toto in the world. And that brings you to T.S.'s question uh, from Fairview, North Carolina. Hi, T.S. Uh, uh, what's the relationship between being humble and being a rascal? So this is a great question because if the rascal is not humble, then the rascal is an asshole, 
<laughs> that's a technical term, so hopefully it's not too offensive. But that's why it has to be done with humor, not only humor like George Carlin directing it at someone else, but humor at yourself, knowing that, this, that we do not know ultimately the truth, so we have to really be open and humble about, you know, walk humbly with our God. So, so in my mind, the relationship between being humble and being a rascal is essential. If a rascal isn't humble, a rascal is dangerous. Uh, so, so you have to look at the quality of your rascality. Uh, I, I think that um, someone told me today, during one of, after one of my talks, they love the fact, I'm trying to really quote this, it was nice. She said, I love the fact that you're so convinced, convinced of your ideas, and yet at the same time, don't insist that we, we follow them. So there's something like that. Uh, Pearl from, um, oh no, there's no way I can say this. Dalonega? Dalonega? Yeah. She says, I really miss the information from Virtual Yeshiva. I love you, Pearl. <laughs> I miss it too. Virtual Yeshiva was my first attempt to, to you know, work on the web, and it was a, a whole school we were building with all this. It was a growing body of, of information about Judaism, as I understand Judaism. And somehow, this is the fact, somehow it was hacked and turned into a porn site. So all the material that was on Virtual Shiva, www.virtualshiva.com, the URL was there, but the content was gone, replaced by a porn site. That said, on the other hand, we got more hits once we were a porn site than we ever got when we were a Jewish site. So that must tell us something. But yeah, it's, all that material was lost. I couldn't recreate it. It's just gone. Mommy, I share one other question with you. It says, four perennial truths seem to contradict what Stephen Prothero says in God is not one. Can you explain differences and similarities? Yeah, so this is a little technical if you don't know who Stephen Prothero is, but if you don't, you should, you should you go look him up if you're interested in religion. He's written a lot of books, but his best book is called, well, his, the book on this topic is called God is Not One. And he's talking about the theology. When I said earlier, you know, a Catholic theologian will never discover Krishna is God. So God is not one. Or when I said the Jewish God doesn't have a son and the Jewish God never spoke to Muhammad. But of course, Allah, the Muslim God, spoke to Muhammad most, pu most purely, most, most effectively. So uh, Prothero says God is not one. You can't say that uh, Adonai in Judaism and, ya and, and uh, Allah and Brahman and uh, Vishnu and, and Krishna and, and all in Jesus and all these the Trinity that all these ideas of God are the same thing they're not each religion is unique that's the religion of that's the corporate religion as I would put it that's not Prothero's words that's the corporate religion the religion that has buildings and clergy and all of that but when you talk to the mystics of these religions you go beyond all that and you discover that whatever the ultimate reality is it's the ultimate reality for all of us and the names we use are, again, like the Buddhists say, fingers pointing toward the thing that is unnameable. But, just to make sure I'm giving you the full Prothero thing, when asked about that, about mysticism, Stephen seems very dismissive. I'm not the only one who thinks that, but I, I'm taking responsibility for the statement. When he's interviewed and, and they ask him, what about mystics? He goes, he dismisses them. It sounds to me that he dismisses them. And he doesn't talk about them in his book. So, so on the corporate level, God is not one. Each religion has its own thing. But on the mystic level, I think you transcend the corporate world and you experience something that is that non-dual reality. So I want to thank everybody who, who was kind enough thank to give you, me their, their hour. Thank you, and, and thank you, Kathy and Wendy. I know Hello. so much work went into this. And you, he's off camera. You can't see him. He's sitting here to my left. But Cameron was really very helpful in getting this to, to the technology to work on my end. So thanks to all of you. And hopefully I'll, I'll be able to see and talk to some of you on the uh, uh, five existential questions series coming up in April.